Welcome. I'd like to call the February 8th Wichita Board of Education meeting to order. I welcome everyone here, everyone here present. The Wichita Public Schools would like to be the district of choice um, in our region where all students and staff are empowered to dream, believe, and achieve. If you would join with me for a moment of silence. Thank you. And if you'd rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Dr. Mike, if you would uh, read our statement about the COVID modified meeting format, please. Yes, thank you. My name is Mike Willamy, clerk of the board. This regular public meeting of the Wichita Public Schools is taking place at the North High Lecture Hall, 1437 Rochester in Wichita. Due to the governor's declaration of emergency and due to health and safety concerns that exist because of COVID-19, no members of the public are present at this meeting. This meeting is available to be viewed live by the public in the following ways. WPS-TV on Cox Cable Channel 20. The district's website at www.usd259.org forward slash WPS-TV online and live stream apps for phone, Roku, and Apple TV by searching WPS-TV. After today's meeting, a recording of this meeting will be available on Cox Cable Channel 20 and the WPS YouTube channel. The agenda for this meeting was published on February 4, 2021 at www.usd259.org forward slash BOE under the BOE meetings agendas and minutes tab. The news media also received the main agenda and a portfolio containing the appendices. There were no revisions after publication. At this meeting, all board members, district staff, and presenters will identify themselves by name and position before they speak to assist the public in, the follow in following the meeting. The usual public communications item that allows members of the public to speak at board meetings has been removed from the agenda. In its place, an email public comment item has been added. Information about how patrons can submit email comment is included in the BOE agenda. Public communications will be placed back in the agenda when the public again starts attending meetings. There will be an executive session at the end of this meeting. The following procedure will be used concerning the executive session. A motion will be presented by a board member that states the subject matter and justification under the Kansas Open Meetings Act for going into executive session. The motion will state the time the board will return from executive session. The live broadcast of the meeting will not end until the board returns from executive session and adjourns the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Next item. Under reports, recognition of outgoing board president, Cheryl Logan. I Stan Reeser, uh, Board of Education, District 4, current uh, board president. As you know, uh, this is my first meeting and uh, it's an exciting time to, for a new beginning. But we also, on this board, like to recognize our history and our past. And the nice part of it is, is this is not the end of it, but I'd like to ask uh, Cheryl Logan to come to the podium. Cheryl, we uh, wanted to take time as a board to quickly thank you for your years of service. Um, the reason why we are doing this uh, slightly different than what we've done in the past is we went through the history of this and this is the first time that someone has ever, uh, since the uh, Wichita School District has consolidated um, in the 60s, 
This, you are the longest serving uh, president we've ever had on the Wichita Board of Education, a total of four and a half years as president. And the reason why there's a half in there, I don't know if any of you remember when the legislature changed the rules on us a little bit where we used to elect our officers in July and now we elect them in January. So the year that we went from July to uh, January, you were nice enough to continue that last six months. So that's why we have half a year. But not only were you the longest uh, serving president we've ever had on this board, you've also served two and a half years consecutively. Um, and that is also the longest time we've ever had. So we just wanted to take a moment to thank you for that service. Uh, we truly appreciate it. And like I said, even though we like to discuss the past, we know you're gonna stay with us and we love that. And we wanted to present this clock for your Distinguished Service Award. And if you'd like to say a few words, we'd be happy for you to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my goodness, this is beautiful. Thank you very, very much. And it, it is easy to stand up when you're leaving and you don't have to to be the leader in the, in the president's role anymore. But, but the one thing I wanna say as, as this passes to Stan is that it's easy to lead a board that pays attention to what's going on, that cares about kids over everything, that really wants to do the right thing, even in the most difficult of circumstances. And that's the kind of board all of you are. And I greatly appreciate your service because we wouldn't be where we are in these difficult times without each one of you taking part of the role of being a leader and stepping up and doing what you believe is right. So thank you for honoring me. I greatly appreciate it, but I wanna say thank you to you as well. Thanks. Thank you, Cheryl, and we really appreciate your years of service. It, we know that uh, you led us through some tough issues, and it's nice to know that you will still be here to help us uh, with future issues. Dr. Mike? Continuing under reports, good news facilitated by Wendy Johnson from Strategic Communications. Good evening, board members. It is um, a pleasure to once again be back before you for our second Return of Good News presentation. Tonight, we have the opportunity to recognize students. It's really cool to see that we have students from three schools that have been recognized as Scholastic Art Award recipients. I think another opportunity to show all of you, all of us, our community that despite the wacky year, that this 150th year has been so far, we have students doing really cool things. And you will get to hear from Mr. Chastain tonight more about that Scholastic Art Award. And then Susie Finn will join you on video. I must say it was pretty overwhelming when I looked at the list that Susie put together of all of the partners that in some way, shape or form have supported our district and our kids this year. And we know that's not over yet, but we thought it was important, particularly as Dr. Thompson shares more with you tonight about our response to COVID through the lens of your strategic plan, that the notion of the shared theme of engaging the community and working to build trust with our school district has in fact been happening and the hard work that you all and all of us have done the last two and a half years or so through the lens of our strategic plan has enabled and, and encouraged all of the partners that you will soon see to step up and say yes to the opportunity to help our kids. So we're excited to bring you these two and without further ado, please cast your eyes on the video screens to share in these two items.
Good evening, President Reeser, Superintendent Thompson, and members of the board. I want to start by thanking WPS Scholastic students and faculty for sharing digital images of our award-winning student artwork for tonight's viewing, and also to Marcia Skirfield, WPS Visual Arts Curriculum Coach, for organizing this slideshow. The Scholastic Art and Writing Awards is the oldest and most prestigious recognition program for creative teenagers in the United States. Each work is reviewed by a panel of arts professionals for originality, technical skill, and an emergence of professional vision and voice. As you can imagine, it's been a unique year for Scholastics, but with much perseverance, our WPS teachers and students submitted Gold Key, Silver Key, and Honorable Mention winners. We even have an American Visions nominee, which is a huge honor as only five American Vision nominees are selected from the pool of Gold Key winners. From the total of 45 WPS selected artworks, our 12 Gold Key and 14 Silver Key will be on display at the Eastern Kansas Scholastic Art Awards exhibition hosted by Wichita's Mark Arts from Friday, February 12th through Saturday, March 27th. While we want to thank and congratulate these award-winning students and faculty, I also want to recognize any parents, family members, and administrators that are joining us tonight online. Thank you for your continued support of these talented students. So, how about a virtual round of applause for our scholastic students, teachers, parents, family members, and administrators. Following tonight's good news item, Ms. Skirfield and I will be distributing to each of our winners a certificate of recognition prepared by our district's strategic communications division. Once again, if anyone would like to view the entire exhibition, it is at Mark Arts, 1307 North Rock Road, and will start Friday, February 12th until the March 27th awards ceremony where numerous college scholarships will be awarded. Finally, many thanks to our Board of Education and District Leadership for once again supporting our Wichita Public Schools' excellent representation at this year's Scholastic Art Awards. Thanks, everyone. Good evening, President Reeser, Vice President Blankley, Superintendent Thompson, and members of the board. I am proud to present the good news about the many ways our Wichita community has supported Wichita Public Schools and its students since last March. I first want to recognize four groups that provided significant resource contributions, especially at the beginning of this pandemic. The Assistance League of Wichita has continued its mission of providing school clothing to students in need by supporting the McKinney Vento program and Title I schools, and by providing a donation of $10,000 worth of child-sized masks in the fall. All this even while their own resources were stretched due to the pandemic. Exploration Place not only set up a remote learning site for students, the organization staff started creating virtual content for students learning at home in the spring, and then they continued that work with our curriculum team this fall to create more than 40 STEM lessons designed for remote learning just for our staff at no cost. Project Teacher continued its mission in providing necessary school supplies to teachers and expanded that work this year to include significant donations of cloth masks and cleaning supplies, on top of the everyday school supplies that they continue to provide to teachers. And the Wichita Community Foundation worked with its donors to provide financial support for the Food for Kids collaboration that I'll touch on more in a minute and remote learning printing efforts in the spring. We had several critical partners that helped us feed our students, starting with Medi's and the group of restaurants that immediately provided food and servers to put meals in kids' hands while our nutrition services team developed a robust plan for meal distribution. Then Credit Union of America and Cargill both stepped up with financial donations to help that food service run in both the spring and the summer. In addition, we want to acknowledge the support of two major initiatives that Terrell Davis oversaw last spring and this fall. In the spring, he rallied groups including First Student, the WPS Transportation Department, Real Men Real Heroes, the Wichita Police Department, the WPS Magna Office, the Pando Initiative, Greater Wichita Ministerial League, the Wichita Branch of NAACP, Rise Up for Youth, and Newman University 
to ensure that students who usually receive the Kansas Food Bank's weekend food support would still be able to have that source of needed food during the spring shutdown. Then in the fall, when we knew that many families would need internet support, he brought together 35 area churches to support the Closing the Homework Gap initiative, providing much appreciated financial resources to ensure that no student in our district would go without the opportunity to learn, whether at home or at school. When we knew graduation couldn't be celebrated like normal, KWCH worked with us to secure sponsors and TV time to make sure that we could produce segments honoring all of our 2020 high school graduates. In a typical year, our students enjoy the opportunities available to explore the many cultural institutions and nonprofit organizations that Wichita has to offer. With restrictions in place on field trips for the safety of our students and staff, the instructional services team, led by Diane Smokorowski, began organizing virtual field trips. These provided teachers and students with much appreciated supplements to the curriculum, as well as provided our local, state, and even national organizations with ways to continue to reach our students virtually. More than 40 local and state organizations have participated in these adventures that have reached more than 110,000 students since the first virtual safari in October. That's many more than the 47,000 plus students that we have in our district. And there are still more of these adventures to come. We also want to recognize those area nonprofits and businesses that realized the need for safe places for students to learn virtually while their parents and guardians continued to work. We thank the Greater Wichita YMCA, Salvation Army, Wichita State University, Boys and Girls Clubs of South Central Kansas, Clay Kids, Isora Elaine Dean Educational Center, Sedgwick County Zoo, Strategic Workspace, YEEP Training Center, Exploration Place, and It Takes a Village for providing remote learning centers for students and families who needed that support. Finally, we want to thank some of our community partners that provided school supplies through donation drives in the late summer. Many of these groups have worked with us on supply drives for years. This year, they change their routines and their focus to ensure that the newly necessary supplies of cloth masks, reusable water bottles, headphones, and other COVID and remote learning specific needs were met. This is but a snapshot of the many ways that the Wichita community supports Wichita Public Schools. Without these organizations contributing in many different ways, the hard work that our teachers and leaders do to serve students would be even harder. For that, we say thank you. And we look forward to the day when we can once again welcome so many other volunteers and partners into our buildings to continue the great work of empowering our students and staff to dream, believe, and achieve. Thank you, Wendy, for bringing the good news to us, and we appreciate those two items. If, it, uh, if the board would uh, allow a little bit of uh, indulgence here, I would like to move that we, before we get to the next item of uh, the report from our friends at uh, Service Employees International, I'd like to move that we move the new business item up to this portion of the uh, agenda. I second. It's been moved by Stan Reeser and seconded by Cheryl Logan to move the new business item up to this portion of the agenda. All those in, and then uh, we'll let, it looks like we're ready. That is correct. Cheryl, Cheryl Logan seconded it. And if you would vote now, please. <clears throat> Motion carries 7-0. We're now gonna conduct uh, new business at this time. At this time, I'd like to recognize my colleague, Mike Rohde. Thank you, Stan. I'd like to uh, formally submit my resignation from the board of USD 259, effective immediately. For personal reasons. Uh, is that a motion to con deduct a new business as well? Yes. Okay, we will take an official vote to have this new business on the agenda. 
uh, Mike has made a motion to bring up new business concerning his resignation from this board. Is there a second? I second it. Seconded by Ernestine Crable. And I think we are ready to vote. That also passes 7-0. I'd like to recognize Mike Rohde again. Uh, I apologize, I should have made that a little more clear. Um, but Mike, um, you, you mentioned resignation, so I would like you to go ahead and you have the floor. Do it one more time. I sincerely request from, to uh, resign from the Board of Education effective immediately due to personal reasons. Before we actually take a motion on that, out of respect to my colleague, uh, Mike Rohde, uh, I would like to ask him if he would prefer that we take a small break before we take the vote, or would you like us to proceed? Okay. Uh, I Cheryl move, Logan? I move that we accept the resignation of Mike Rohde. Uh, Cheryl was uh, on That's my right. list here first, so I'll okay. see if she wants to do that. Yeah, I can second her motion. That's fine. That's fine. Great. Uh, we have a motion from Ernestine Crable, seconded by Cheryl Logan, to um, accept the resignation of Mike Rohde effective immediately. If you would cast your vote, please. That passes 7-0. Um, Mike, would you like us to take a 10-minute break at this time? or would, Because we do need to go through a, a list of procedures on how we're going to replace you. And uh, I know you don't want a bunch of uh, speeches, so I'm going to leave that up to you out of courtesy to do your decision. And you would prefer a small break? I'm sorry. We'll take a five minute break and then um, we will have a series of motions and explanations on how this Board of Education proceeds with this new business. And we'll be back in uh, five minutes, which is 628. Okay, we'll resume the February 8th Board of Education meeting. I just wanted to say that um, we appreciate Mike Rohde's years of service on the Wichita Board of Education. I think Mike's legacy will always be the fact that number one, he had a special place in his heart and he worked very hard for children of special needs in our district. Um, he will always be remembered for that. I think the second thing is the fact that before he got on the Board of Education, he was a big uh, Northwest High School booster and athletic booster, and many in that Northwest community credit him for, for fundraising and for helping them bring their sports uh, teams to a different level, and we appreciate that. But I think the biggest thing we will that Mike's legacy will be will be the fact that he had an unwavering support of public education. And in this day and age, um, we appreciated that commitment. And uh, it's Mike just told me that he is on speed dial for any of us if we ever want to call him. And so uh, we appreciate Mike's years of service. Cheryl? Um, yes. Uh, everything that you said about Mike is absolutely true. and. Uh, we're going to miss him on this board. He was not afraid to speak his mind, and that's a good thing. That makes us think more deeply, and that's wonderful. Having been on the board as long as I have, I have been through three different times that we had to replace uh, board members, and so we do have a history and a pattern of what we do with that. So uh, I'd, I think we need to... Um, to, as we look at replacing the District 5 position, 
um, using our policy 200, I move that we just discuss this subject matter as part of new business so that we can go ahead and move on finding a replacement for our board member as quickly as possible. That's very appropriate. Do I have a second for that motion? Second. Moved by Cheryl Logan that we bring up an item concerning the appointment of a new board member for District 5, uh, five to replace uh, Mike Rohde uh, and seconded by Julie Hedrick. And you may vote, cast your vote. That motion carries six, six zero. Okay. And the very first thing that we have to do as a board is we, ha uh, I move that we ask the clerk of the board uh, be directed to publish one time in the Wichita Eagle on February the 11th, stating that a vacancy has occurred in the BOE District 5 seat and that the unexpired term will be filled by appointment by the board not sooner than 15 days after the publication of that notice. Is there a second? Ben Blankley, District 1, I second. Moved by Cheryl, seconded by Ben Blankley. That uh, the clerk be directed to publish the notice of vacancy and that uh, the board discuss the uh, desire of a concerning appointment of that new board member. And you may vote. That passes 6-0. I will call on the uh, superintendent at this time to explain the process of uh, replacing um, Mr. Rohde. I, I will um, do my best and I have my colleagues with me um, in case I need some assistance. They will, they will support me um, to make sure that I have everything uh, correct. Um, the, 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 um, one of the first things that we need to do would be to publish the notice uh, for in the Wichita Eagle and we will do that um, as you so voted on for February the 11th. Um, the deadline for those application forms will be, uh, will, this is how we've done it the last three or four, four or five times that this has occurred. Uh, the application will be available for two weeks. So it will be February the 24th at noon will be the deadline for the application form and that uh, application um, will uh, be available uh, again from that website at the Board of Education as well as information on the Wichita Eagle and Eagle. Um, from that, um, the Board of Education then would take those applications and have the opportunity uh, to review those. Uh, then there would be an opportunity for inter to conduct interviews. Um, those interviews will be conducted um, and I will allow the board president to make any announcements there, but there would be uh, uh, um, interviews for the applicants. Um, from there, uh, we will then need to vote on that particular, uh, there, however many um, candidates there are, then you would interview them and then you would vote on them for the following board meeting. Um, then from there, you would have a new board member, uh, then they would of course need to go to the elections office and be sworn in. And then of course, either that happens here at a board meeting or they can do that uh, at the uh, offices at Cedric County. So that pretty much takes us through the processes um, and we can set those dates and things up for you uh, as we move along the journey of this process and um, I'll take directions from our board president. Thank you, uh, Dr. Thompson. Um, the first initial uh, date that everyone will need to pay attention to is the deadline to get in the application if you live within the fifth district and if you are a registered voter is Feb Wednesday, February 24th at noon. You can pick up the application uh, for um, uh, to fill the vacancy at the uh, school board clerk's office. And, uh, but that first deadline will be February 24th. 
And after we uh, go through one more motion, I th which I think will cover and cross the T's and dot the I's, uh, I will uh, give the board members uh, the new meeting schedule, if that's okay. Uh, can I add just another, just so that folks in the audience uh, that's listening on, the, um, on television, um, you have to be a resident in the, um, in the boundaries of the District 5, and you can go online and pull that up to see the scope of what the um, boundaries are. And then you have to be 18 years old or older to also be able to fill this position. So I just want to make sure that there are, that you kind of know what um, it takes to be able to be uh, able to be considered. There is an application there and once you get online, you'll be able to get this application. And in the application, it is required there that you um, have three letters of recommendation. Um, and then there is a small section there that gives you uh, a, a small portion of, of space to be able to share with the board members why you would like to become a member of the Board of Education, uh, become a member of the Board of Education. And so once you have um, all of those pieces uh, filled out, then you, those are the things that will be presented to the board. So I just kind of wanted to kind of map that out for anyone out there that's listening that um, would like to uh, have the opportunity to uh, apply and know the criteria to do so. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Um, the application is also available. You can uh, print offline. I'm such, I'm so old school, I still just tell people to go to the office, but uh, it's actually easier to just go to www dot usd 259.org slash boe and the application can print you can print it off there which has um, your application and then also the instruction about the three references and so forth and i think before we get to that last motion which would finalize this um, let me tell you what the uh, the new meeting schedule would be that way you would know exactly what you're voting on with this last motion. Uh, what we will do now is the we will have a special Board of Education meeting. Um, excuse me. The, the, the meetings, the special meetings, February 22nd and March 29th will be canceled. The special, we will then have a special B Board of Education meeting on Wednesday, March 3rd at 6 p.m. here at North High's Lecture Hall. That will be the night that we interview the qualified applicants for the BOE District 5 position. Um, and then the Good Apple Award Program previously scheduled for Monday, Mar uh, April 12th. That's going to be canceled due to the pandemic anyway, but then instead we will have April 12th will be the first day of the Good Apple Week throughout the district. So that's kind of a side issue, but I wanted you to be aware of that as well. So basically our February 22nd and our March 29th meeting are canceled if we have a motion. And then we will have a special meeting March 3rd to interview the qualified applicants as they come in. And again, that deadline will be February 24th. Julie Hedrick, District 2. I move that the February 22nd and the March 29th meetings be canceled and that a special BOE meeting be scheduled for Wednesday, March 3rd at 6 p.m. at North High in order for the board to interview uh, um, uh, the candidates uh, that will be having interviews Excellent. to replace uh, Mike Rohde. Is there a second to that motion? I second. And again, that application is available at www usd259.org slash boe we have a motion on the floor by julie hedrick and seconded by cheryl logan that uh, implements this reset uh, replacement process and we are ready to vote
Motion carries 6-0. And again, we thank Mike Rohde for his years of service on the Wichita Board of Education. And we look forward to uh, speaking and interviewing the applicants who are interested in taking on this challenging role. Um, and before we get back to the agenda, I'd like to just take a moment to uh, also announce that this is uh, our attorney's Tom Powell's last BOE meeting. Uh, Tom, if you'd stand for just a second. Tom uh, has how many years? Come on down to the podium. <laughs> <laughs> And Tom has promised me that he's not leaving just because I became president. Uh, <laughs> this is retirement season. Tom, how long have you uh, been our lead attorney for the Wichita Board of Education? Uh, a long time. <laughs> no, uh, I, I remember it well. Uh, I, I was with the city of Wichita, and I left the city and went to a firm. In fact, I think... Uh, you may have been on the city council when I when I uh, left to go to the Hinkle firm, and I left on uh, I went to work for the Hinkle firm June first and July eighth, nineteen ninety one. Uh, our firm was selected to be the board's legal counsel. Well, Tom, we appreciate <laughs> the years of service, uh, and. You will be greatly missed. Our new lead attorney is Dan Lawrence. I'm not sure if Dan, yep. yes, Dan's in the audience. Thank you, Dan, if you want to stand. This is Dan Lawrence, who will now be our uh, attorney. He'll be our new Tom Powell. <laughs> and, and Dan's going to be great. Just We get him young and wear him out. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't know, but I'm just five years older than Dan. Huh? <laughs> No, it's, it's been a great honor to uh, represent the, being a lawyer and represent the, the school board and the district. And I, you know, I've had three professional jobs and my favorite by far is representing the school board. I think that uh, you are people I really like working for. I think that uh, everybody has the same mission and that's educating children and everybody keeps their minds to it and it's just great to work with everybody and tom we really appreciate you thank you thank you and welcome to dan also <laughs> yes and thank you, Dan Lawrence, for taking on this challenge. We look forward to working with you as well. And I promise I have not run Tom off of two jobs. I promise. <laughs> I'm suspicious. <laughs> yes, it, it is. It is. Yes. Yes. It's just a coincidence. Um, we will now go back to the uh, normal agenda. I appreciate the indulgence the board uh, showed us on this. Thank you very much. Dr. Mike? Continuing under reports, Service Employees International, SEIU. Is Esau here to make his report? Okay. Um, I think we can go to the next one, and if Esau steps back in time, we'll allow him have time, too. So, Dr. Mike, the next item. Continuing under reports, United Teachers of Wichita. Welcome, Kim. Thank you. I mean, I kind of worried this was meeting was not going to be as exciting as previous <laughs> ones, but um, good evening, President Reeser, Vice President Blankley, Dr. Thompson, and BOE members. First, I have to kind of say that you guys are kind of messing with the teacher and me because you have had assigned seats for the past like couple years, <laughs> and you all switched them up, and that seating chart in my head cannot wrap my head around it yet, but I'll get used to it. As always, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all about the concerns and issues our teachers are experiencing, especially during this unique time. And one of the things I think we must all be concerned about right now is fatigue. Um, this pandemic has been going on for so long and everyone is just plain exhausted. It is important that we acknowledge that and it is important that we combat that fatigue with renewed and regular calls for vigilance. 
Yes, our COVID positivity rate has decreased, and yes, our staff quarantines are down from where they once were, but we will be in the same mess we were in last fall if we do not continue our vigilance. We continue to hear from teachers who are being forced to attend face-to-face -face meetings at school that could just as easily be held virtually. Why are we taking these risks? We continue to hear from teachers whose administrators are not enforcing the mask mandates at school with real conviction. We must keep our expectations high and trust that they can and will be met by students and staff alike. We have evidence of this in buildings where those expectations are set high and where enforcement is taken seriously. We ask that you continue to send a clear and strong message that social distancing and correct mask usage will be enforced in Wichita Public Schools. We also want to point out that these expectations can be met by our elementary specials teachers in their own classrooms. Um, despite all we've learned about COVID-19, we are presently allowing secondary age students to take art class in the art room or PE in the gymnasium. How is that equitable? Elementary students whose transmission rate is statistically lower must have their specials classes brought to them. Our elementary specials teachers have been teaching from carts, which makes it more difficult to meet their own curricular standards, running from room to room without so much as a moment for a bathroom break. Um, we ask that you please find out why elementary specials teachers cannot have their classrooms and gymnasiums back. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us or to those teachers. Another item I'd like to bring to your attention is the annual UTW work environment survey for all certified staff. For many years now, UTW has administered this survey and distributed the data to both individual buildings and downtown administration as well. At the building level, building committees can study and discuss the survey results and address building level issues accordingly. Diligent and committed principals are often as eager to see the results as teachers and they use the information to drive improvements. At the district level, administration can see trends from year to year and from building to building, as well as get feedback on things like PD and curricular support. This year, we added questions on the survey specifically for nurses and special education teachers who have been especially impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we asked some questions about remote teaching as well. Of course, we will send the results of our survey to you, but we wanted to give you a heads up so that you're looking for it. Um, we thank you for listening to our concerns, and I hope we see these concerns addressed. Thank, thank you, you, Kim. Let's uh, circle back to the uh, report from Service Employees International, just in case Esau had a chance to come back. It does not appear he has. So, uh, Dr. Mike, next item, please. Email public comment. We had 121 persons uh, send emails regarding this agenda, and the board president and superintendent have copies of the emails tonight, and the full board received the emails this morning in an email. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Next item. Education. Every Student Future Ready Strategic Plan, Student and Staff-Centered Response to COVID Pandemic. The Every Student Future Ready Plan focuses on four long-term goals. One, increase the high school graduation rate. Two, increase third grade reading proficiency. Three, increase the percentage of students completing dual credit, concurrent credit, industry certification, or other college and career readiness opportunities, and four, ensure that schools are trusted as safe places by students, parents, staff, and community. Tonight's presentation will highlight ways the district has remained focused on strategic plan priorities as we have responded to the COVID pandemic. This presentation is for the board's information. Dr. Thompson, I think this board is more than uh, waiting for this type of report again. So uh, I will turn it over to you. Awesome. To President Stan Reeser and uh, Vice President, Mr. Ben Blankley. Um, to all of my board members, uh, good evening. Haven't had a chance to address all of you, so good evening. Good evening. Are y'all smiling or y'all just looking at me? Loosen <laughs> <laughs> up, loosen up. Good evening. How are you guys doing? Good evening. Good evening. All right. Good deal. All right. 
So I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to share an update on our work this year through the lens of, of your strategic plan. It is important to speak to you this evening as conversations occurred at our local, state, national level about what school districts have done to focus our students, especially those considered at risk based on economic and social and emotional factors. Some of those talking will tell you that we have failed our students, that we have missed the opportunity to focus on those who are most vulnerable, and that we have not spent our funds wisely during this very difficult time. And I am here to tell you they are wrong. Do we face challenges as we move forward? Absolutely. Will there be significant learning losses that our students will face? That is no question about that. There will be loss. In fact, the next report we will bring back to you will dig deeper into some of those academic data and how we will use a different kind of summer learning opportunity so that we can help our most vulnerable students recover some of those losses. We will also share more in a future presentation about the financial aspects of our work, how we've spent CARES and other targeted dollars, and what our plan is for future funds we anticipate coming into our district. The truth is that through your leadership and the extraordinary efforts of our staff and our leaders throughout Wichita Public Schools, we have revolutionized this district in a matter of months. We have built infrastructure out of the necessity that will support exciting learning opportunities for years to come. As we set the stage for the strategic plan update and look ahead that will come later this year, I wanted to be sure that you know that every decision we have made has been focused on our purpose, student success through the eyes of our strategic plan. Your strategic plan is built around providing each student with an innovative and rigorous educational experience. The pandemic has definitely challenged our existing service models, but our team responded with commitment, resilience, and a resolve to everything possible to meet the unique needs of our learners. A year ago, we didn't know anything about Education Imagine Academy. What was that? We didn't know that something called My School Remote would exist. And we didn't know how profound the safety challenges of the pandemic would impact on-site work and learning. However, as a district, we made magic happen. I couldn't say enough how transformative your decision was to focus your primary cares on the digital equity and opportunity for our students. When the technology deployment was all said and done, this district overcame a digital divide in our community that deployed 49,000 computer devices. And as important as the devices are, the true game changer, as you all know, emerged because we now have 14,000 families who have internet access at home for their students through MiFi's and devices with internet built in. Let that sink in. Let that sink in. As I learn about the work of districts across the country and the challenges that at-risk students face with remote learning due to the lack of access, what you all have engaged to deploy to our students is extraordinary. I'm sure Rob Dixon had no idea what he would be getting into when he joined our school district, did you, Rob? But I am so very glad he is with us to lead this transformation. Our team's ability, ability to think creatively and safely about the service of our students with special needs allowed us to bring 1,700 pre-K through 12 students on campus through the fall to assure their needs were being met. Our transportation team supported this important opportunity through 249 daily bus routes and shuttles. I know this wasn't easy for families, our building leaders, or for our teachers, who were at times very, very concerned about their own health and safety. But however, the leadership and professionalism of our team allowed students with the greatest needs to find success during the pandemic. We made that same type of commitment to our high school students who needed access to specialized labs or equipment for their career and technical education classes, 
or who were identified as at risk of not graduating due to credit loss. Hundreds of students reported to our high school campuses this fall for individualized support based on their need. Although the lens of our commitment to increasing graduation, we provided robust college and career learning opportunities and supporting safe schools and environments. Perhaps the biggest innovation to impact learning this year and made possible by the technology implication I mentioned is what we know as My School Remote. Everybody say it, My, My School, School Remote. Remote. For a district that didn't know much about Microsoft Teams one year ago, the fact that we deploy Microsoft Teams throughout the system as an integrated learning platform and that we've had more than 21.6 million activities on Teams this fall alone. You know, that is remarkable your leadership board members, and your support and willingness to allow us to be innovative in our response to this pandemic will impact learning for years to come, regardless of what learning models look like when we emerge from COVID. But for now, please reflect on the opportunity your leadership has provided to students of all ages and abilities during this once in a lifetime school year. Leadership and collaboration within our district and, and also with our community has provided a safe learning spaces and innovative opportunities for hundreds of students, including foster children, at-risk students, and high achievers. I wanted to give a shout out to our community partners who supported remote learning at places like Wichita State with the Base Learning Lounge, the YMCA, Boys and Girls Club, It Takes a Village, Del Rose United Methodist Church, and Exploration Place, just to name a few. And we'd like to also thank the work from Terrell Davis with the outreach earlier this fall. We had the opportunity to have dozens of faith leaders step up and help to support internet connectivity for all of our students and families. Combined with donations of masks, school supplies for our students, assistance supporting meal distribution this summer and so much more, we were able to witness remarkable generosity from people who care deeply about the success of our students in this district. And one of the best things we could do was to recruit the amazing Diane Smokorowski to our school district. And we call her Smoke, because sometimes we have a hard time getting that <laughs> name out. So we call her Smoke, that's our love name for her, Smoke. And through her leadership and collaboration with Susie Finn and Strategic Communication, we had dozens of partners and communities beyond um, that were able to help us do the remarkable Ed Ventures, which were virtual field trips that literally spanned the globe. We have had so much fun going all around the country, uh, seeing all the cool things around our country and didn't have to leave our, our seats. Uh, so we wanna thank her for that awesome opportunities um, that we have provided for our students. There has been probably 43 local or state organizations that have partnered in at least one virtual field trip and another 15 partners from across the country. This is cool. So collaboration also brings to mind amazing efforts that our school and nutrition services have joined together to execute. In addition to serving more than 1 million, 1 million meals, to students attending schools on site this fall, we have distributed nearly one million curbside meals just in this fall alone. Combined with almost 900,000 meals delivered remotely last spring and summer, the district's commitment to nourish our students in our community will not go unnoticed. Communication, we know that communication is key to building trust and is one of the strategic themes identified uh, strategies in the ever student, every student ready future strategic plan. Since our first message to families and staff about the pandemic in mid-March, we have been committed to open and transparent communication. While people haven't always liked the decisions we've made, it has been virtually important it has been vitally important to continue reaching out to keep our community engaged in this important and difficult work. At this time, I'd like to give a shout out to Ms. Terry Moses, 
our Division Director of Safety and Environmental Services, who stepped up to lead our pandemic team and who has uh, repeatedly been on the front lines of our communication efforts for this crisis that seems to never end, though I think we might be seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, at least we hope that we are. As a district, we've registered more than six million contacts through ParentLink since March, not to mention the individual phone calls our building leaders and staff have fielded from our stakeholders. Teams, that platform that we didn't know any much about a year ago, has registered more than 1.6 million meetings. When you think about this, combined with the digital equity strategies I mentioned earlier, this district has gone to remarkable lengths to create an infrastructure and opportunity for all of our children to succeed. Before I move on, I would be remiss if I didn't say that I'm really proud of you our Board of Education for your own digital equity commitment. When the environment for board meetings changed in the spring, we quickly transitioned to live broadcast. Then this summer, you made the commitment to permanently transform accessibility to your Board of Education meetings by committing to regularly live broadcast for your, in this chamber here at North, for all to see. Thousands of staff and citizens join you each meeting to observe the public's business conducted at your table. And this has been really important to promote transparency and engagement in your work. Next, I want to touch on the lessons about resilience and perseverance that our staff and students will have gained from this very difficult year. Notice I didn't say the word pivot. We will ban that word from our vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> our elementary staff, students, and families paved the way for our two model form of learning with students on site and student remote, then students who wanted to change the models and teachers who wanted to change the model, and then students who all had to pivot online in late November and then back again. And at our secondary schools, the journey to today was very diff different because it was equally challenging with most of our students learning remotely. Targeted students on site, then challenges of athletics and student activities, preparation to move back on site in early November only to remain completely remote through the fall, then our big second semester transition a few weeks ago. And one of the, that was kind of one of the best days of the year so far when we stood in the hallways and we watched the secondary students come and to be present with us since March. It was just an awesome experience that day. Even though their mouths were covered with their masks, I could see the smiles in their eyes. And it was really an awesome day. And I know some of you came out and joined us and it was, it's just awesome. Your plan asserts that we are preparing all students to achieve college and career and life readiness through an innovative and rigorous educational experience. Think about it. As difficult as the last 11 months have been, our students have learned extraordinary lessons of resilience. They have learned to learn differently. They have interacted with technology in ways that may not have occurred before. And they have learned how to problem solve and find success despite the ob obstacles that at times have seemed unbearable. I can't imagine a more important set of college, career, and life readiness for our kids to take away from this difficult school year. The same could be said about the lessons and opportunities that our staff have received. Our amazing professional learning team provided more than 160 virtual professional learning sessions for certified and classified staff between August the 5th and September the 3rd. That's a short span of time, 160 virtual professional development opportunities. Since school started, around 40 presentations have been shared in buildings, in addition to 35 sessions per week to address individual needs like software, teams, assignments, seesaw, ideas regarding technology tools, troubleshooting, and more. As our friend Ms. Smoke has recently said, teachers put out that bat signal and we're there. It's really an extraordinary when you think about the learning curve we all have faced 
and the tremendous growth we've all experienced this year in our efforts to do the very best we possibly could to educate all of our students. Finally, I believe that our community understands the importance through your fourth strategic plan goal that we are absolutely committed to safe school environments. I think the pandemic has shown us how important this aspect of our strategic plan really is. This district has done remarkable work to create the safest possible learning and work environments. Have we hit a home run every time? No. But as we have settled into the second semester, I truly believe that our staff sees the broad level of commitment that this district has made to safety. One thing you can absolutely be proud of is the tremendous testing program we've created for our employees, our students, and their families. Nearly 2,500 individuals have been tested since we began back in November, either through the system symptomatic or asymptomatic tests we offer. As we transition back to in-person learning in January, we conducted three Saturday testing clinics as an additional service to employees and families. Our goal is always to keep sick people at home and get well students and staff back to work and school. We have purchased and distributed over 179,000 reusable masks to every student and staff member in this district. More than 21,000 units of hand sanitizer and disinfectant wipe tubs have been purchased and are readily available in our schools and work locations to assure that staff have the basic supplies needed to be safe. Other PPE includes disposable masks by the thousands and specialized equipment and supplies for nurses, custodians, and other employees whose unique work requires an additional level of safety. I want to say it again, safety has always been our top priority. We know that some, there are some who have questioned this, but I can assure you every member of our district team has been 100% committed to the safest possible learning and work environment. And I know your actions at this board table and the decisions that you have made support that as well. Since I mentioned vaccines, let me give you a quick update. We have a plan in place to administer the vaccinations here, not here, but over there at AMAC. We are set up and ready to receive vaccines and Kimber Cassett, our uh, nurse, on, nurse on, on duty, has established a priority order of vaccination based on Governor Kelly's vaccination plan. As we need to know, as we, all, as we all know right now, one of the things that's missing is the vaccines. <laughs> we don't have them. <laughs> we are ready to roll when we get the word and movement will be fast. However, as of right now, we don't know when we will receive the vaccines, we don't know which one we will receive, and we don't know how many we're gonna get. But as soon as we have that information, we will let you know. So I've taken up a lot of time, so I will conclude here, and I want to summarize by saying this. We have learned a lot about our system since March, and I would also suggest that we've learned a lot about ourselves, too. We were asked to do the impossible, and we have done it. We have pushed ourselves to be successful on the days we didn't think we could, and we used our strategic plan to guide us and to prioritize our decision making. We know that we will have significant learning gaps with some of our students and we must overcome those so that we can have our students to find success. And we will be prepared next month to talk more about how we will begin to address this through an innovative summer programs that we will offer. But if anyone doubts what this district has done to support our students and focus on the unique needs of our learners, you can tell them with confidence that they are wrong. I believe with every bone in my body that as difficult as this journey has been the last 11 months, we will emerge stronger than we were before and resolved to meet the needs of our students in new and creative ways. This, my friends, is what leadership is all about. 
while we haven't talked about our every student future ready strategic plan in a while, like we did when we first started, I am proud that our district has been living our plan as we have undertaken the task of reinventing ourselves more times than once to keep focused on an innovative and rigorous educational experience for our students, despite the overwhelming odds against us caused by the pandemic. You all have used your strategic plan to lead us through difficult times and decisions since March. And for that, as a district, on behalf of the 50,000 students, 47,000, and all of the staff here, we stand to say thank you to the Board of Education um, for all of your hard work and your dedication to this district. We, we commend you and we thank you. And at this time, I stand for any questions that any of you may have. Ben? Uh, ben Blankley, District 1. Um, I know that uh, during this whole time period, um, since we started the school year, um, we've had My School Remote, you know, brand new innovation for our district and, and for a lot of districts across the country. Um, I know that a lot of focus has been placed on the in-person learning environment, um, but uh, I know my family um, is a My School Remote family and I know several others um, that, have, that have had very positive experiences with that remote learning environment. Um, could you elaborate on uh, maybe some anecdata on, on what you've, you've been hearing through the grapevine of, of our family's experience with My School Remote? Yes, it's kind of exactly what you said, Mr. Blankley. Um, we have had people that um, have done really well in this environment with My School Remote and actually have asked as a district, would we be offering this type of learning in the future? Um, and we have, again, as you know, um, some students that did not do well with this learning model at all. And so we, we have work to do. When those students return back to us, uh, we, have, we will be looking at some losses with some of our students and we'll need to be able to put some things in place to be able to uh, decline some of those losses that some of the students have. So it's, 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 you know, it's half and half, and you hear good, and then there's things that are not so well for some of the other students. So it's just a preference. And again, that just goes to, to show you that as a teacher, I know for a fact, we have to t figure out what, how our kids learn best, and that's how we teach. And so again, this just is another example of how we can meet the needs of kids in an innovative way and do it a little bit differently than what we've had before. And some of the students will perform well in those environments. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other? Cheryl? I just want to say thank you very much. Uh, it, it is uh, really nice to hear all the things that have been going on because we've been watching it from afar. But it's amazing how many things have happened over since March of last year, so literally in the last year, and how we've been able to pivot mm -mm. often, <laughs> not that word. Adjust. <laughs> <laughs> We've been able to adjust <laughs> and change <laughs> and modify mm -hmm. as we needed to, to be able to make it work for our students. I, that is to the thanks to you and all of your team, but also to our teachers mm -hmm. and our paras and our workers in the building because everybody's had to adjust, whether you're the custodian or the food service worker or the teacher or the para or anyone else that's working. And I will also give a shout out to the parents and to our community leaders Absolutely. who also have had to pivot and shift with us as well. Well, yeah. pivot is a word, I guess, adjust with us. <laughs> Be fluid with us too. <laughs> uh, I, I also am really excited to know that our strategic plan is now going to be back on the agenda every time mm -hmm. because that's where we've got to continue to focus. And we haven't lost that focus. We've just had to modify it a bit to be able to get through this pandemic. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your hard work and thank you for this report tonight. Mm -hmm. Ernestine? Well, I also want to say thank you because I really do see this is an astounding kind of changes that we've had. The other thing that's happened out of this is that without realizing it, we have, I've had families that have told me 
that whether a child might have been bullied before, that in the My School Remote, this shy student was not bullied, was able to be able to be an independent person and getting a little bit more confident and secure. All of these ways that we've learned about the different ways that kids can learn and different ways that we can react even if we were forced into it, it's, it is wonderful to be able to have this. The other thing that has amazed me, that in, uh, when did we come with these four uh, goals for our uh, strategic plan? What was it, 18, 19? It, it must, About three years it, it was, I've only been in the job three years. It was no so more than, it was I was thinking so it was two years ago three that years. we finally uh, uh, actually right. voted to adopt it. I did some math, believe it or not, I can do some math, but I did some math and figured out that our graduation rate has increased 8% in just two years since we made this commitment. And it's still on its way. And with more of the kinds of ways of learning, we're finding that kids that maybe before dreaded going into the classroom, they have been able to be successful. Now, we do know that there's been a number of parents and a number of students, and quite frankly, sometimes they were the students that were the noisiest ones, have let us know that the remote was not their preferred style of learning. But we've discovered some other things, and I'm just impressed at the creativity. And I do think, <laughs> Rod, that, Rob, that we got all of those computers out and all those parents trained and all those kids. Think about the future as they graduate and go into the work world, we have an entire district of 47,000 students who know how to use computers, who know. I just think of how many of people my age and colleagues even younger that all they know how to do is go to find email. They don't know how to do the things like have joint lessons with others. These children know all of that and are ready for the future. So talk about future ready. Whether we intended for this to be one of the results or not, it's certainly one of the great advantages that we're getting out of this. Thank you to you and all of your staff and all of our, all of our colleagues that support all of this and the teachers down the line. The teachers have put in so many hours trying to do this. I just want to hug them, everyone, but thank you all. Any other questions or comments uh, before we move to the next item? Thank you, Dr. Thompson. I appreciate this uh, effort to refocus. We've never lost focus on what our strategic plan, but we do recognize that uh, as we spent a summer going through uh, the COVID protocols and the safety procedures, that for some in the community, it may have appeared that we uh, were only dealing with COVID issues, but I want to uh, reassure, and we hope this presentation will help reassure uh, that we never lost focus on what we needed to do on our strategic plan. The work and our mission continued throughout this uh, crisis, and it will continue to uh, move forward, and I appreciate that. And I especially appreciate you also thanking the parents and all our community uh, members who uh, helped us on this. And we are looking forward to moving forward. Dr. Mike, next item. Consent. Ron, do you have any items you'd like to pull? Ron Rosales, District 6, I have nothing. Ben? Ben Blankley, District 1, I have nothing to pull. Stan Reeser, District 4, no items. Uh, Cheryl Logan, at large, nothing to pull tonight. Julie Hedrick, District 2, nothing to pull. Ernestine Crable, District 3, nothing to pull. I would entertain a motion to accept the consent agenda. Julie Hedrick, District 2, I move that we uh, accept the consent agenda. I second it. Moved by Julie Hedrick to uh, accept the consent agenda items. Uh, Ernestine Crable seconded. And as soon as we get set up, we will vote.
you may now vote. Consent agenda items pass 6-0. Dr. Mike, next item. Under policy, second review, new BOE policy 0400 non-discrimination statement and cross-references in seven other policies. This agenda item provides a measure to amend the Wichita Public Schools Statement of Non-Discrimination, codify the Statement of Non-Discrimination in new BOE policy 0400, and cross-reference P0400 with seven other policies. Language is included in new BOE policy 0400 to prohibit discrimination on the basis of genetic information. For more information, see the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission's fact sheet, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, in the appendix. Language is also included in other existing policies to more clearly identify behavior that will be considered harassment or discrimination on the basis of sex. This will ensure that language is consistent with several recent decisions of the United States Supreme Court, including Bostock versus Clayton County. For more information, see the executive summary in the appendix. On January 11, 2021, the board had its first review of the following policies and requested no further revisions. After the board's first review, administration noticed that, that the Equity, Diversity, and Magnet Committee mentioned in BOE policy 0900 is no longer active. Thus, AIP, of, AIP 1 of BOE policy 0900 is revised to reflect current practices and AIP 2's reference to the committee is deleted. The policies are as follows. 0400, non-discrimination statement, new policy. This new policy is cross-referenced in the seven policies listed below and controls all BOE policies and other district documents. 0900, Integration and Diversity, revisions to AIP 1 and 2 as noted previously. 0910, Civil Rights Resolution. 1115, Sexual Harassment of Employees. 1116, Sexual Harassment of Students. 1119, harassment of students, 1120, harassment of employees, 4025, equal opportunity employer. It is recommended the board approve the proposed new BOE policy 0400 non-discrimination statement as well as cross-referencing in seven other identified policies. This is our second reading, so we will need a motion today. Any discussions or motions? Ben? Uh, ben Blankley, District 1, I move we take the recommended action. I second it. Moved by Ben and seconded by Ernestine to uh, adopt the second reading of this and take the recommended action. And you may vote. Motion carries six to zero. Dr. Mike, next item. The next item is first review, new BOE policy 1117, sexual harassment and complaint procedures. The Wichita Public Schools prohibits sexual harassment. New BOE policy 1117, sexual harassment and complaint procedures is intended to ensure compliance with certain amendments of the regulations implementing Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972, Title IX, that took effect on August 14, 2020. For Title IX and proposed BOE Policy 1117 purposes, sexual harassment means conduct on the basis of sex that satisfies at least one of the following. A, a school employee conditioning an educational benefit or service upon a person's participation in unwelcome sexual conduct, quid pro quo harassment. B, unwelcome conduct that a reasonable person would find so severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive that it denies a person equal educational access. Or C, sexual assault, dating violence, domestic violence, or stalking. 
an employee found to be responsible for sexual harassment will be subject to discipline up to and including termination. A student found to be responsible for sexual harassment will be subject to discipline up to and including suspension and expulsion. New BOE Policy 1117 supplements BOE Policies 1115 and 1116 described in the previous agenda item. In the event of conflict between the requirements of New BOE Policy 1117 on one hand and 1115 or 1116, New BOE Policy 1117 will control. This item provides an opportunity for the board's first review of new BOE policy 1117, sexual harassment and complaint procedures. This is a first reading of this new policy, so we will not be taking any final votes on this, but this is a time uh, for board members to ask questions or suggest changes or express any concerns they may have on this policy. Julie? Um, since this is uh, our wonderful attorney's last board meeting, shall we put him on the spot for <laughs> one last time? And if uh, Mr. Powell could just come and just kind of give just a simple explanation of this policy and why uh, it's on why he's bringing why this is being brought to us and um, yeah. just maybe a sentence summary about what is yeah. um, what's in it that's that's great and in, nothing is simple when it comes to attorneys and sometimes <laughs> they may use words we do not understand and we'll have to get simplistic so we'll see what he can do on his last well he, last he's sentence. he's great he's great at summarizing things and making them uh, understandable to to uh, lay people so awesome. so he has some friends he's bringing with him so we'll yeah, see what we can get this is the only time you'll have three lawyers to answer your questions so if you have a light bulb we'll try to screw it in and uh, Julie, uh, I'll let you uh, start by just asking what your basic question or concern is on this policy. Um, well, my first question that I wanted uh, him to address was um, why we're adding this additional policy above and beyond our other policies of sexual harassment. And then maybe just a, a simple sentence about, um, I mean, it's, three pages, you know, I'm reading a lot of legalese, just kind of maybe just a, just a simple short statement about uh, what it includes. And I will keep your time open, Julie, if you have follow-up questions. Tom, did you understand uh, what the question was? I, I think so, and, and, and Dan and Bill can jump in if, if I need some help here. Okay. Uh, the answer as to why uh, we're bringing the policy before you is, is really pretty simple. In August of this year, the uh, prior administration adopted some new Title IX regulations, and one of the requirements of this new Title IX regulation is that K-12 public schools and universities have to adopt a policy that meets the, the requirements of the new regulations that were adopted in August 2020. So what was your what was your federal other administration. federal administration? Yes, and, and there is some uh, thought that these regulations will not be in existence forever. The new administration has indicated that they uh, are going to review these regulations, and they may have some changes to them, uh, but changes to regulations takes time. There's a process you go through, and these regulations that were adopted by the prior administration are probably going to be in existence for at least six months. Right. Thank you. And then my second question was just um, without going into a lot of detail, just uh, just um, what does it mean? Right. Well, I, I, I think and Bill can sure jump in here or I, he jump in. Well, <laughs> but, but well, I think I think what it does is it creates due process rights for people that are accused of sexual harassment. 
that weren't in our policies before. So I think that's the big change. They have uh, rights to be uh, made aware of the investigation that's been made and the findings in the investigation, and they have certain rights regarding uh, uh, rights to appeal and, and participation at the hearing, depending on whether it's student or an employee. William, I think I'll have you uh, state your name for the record and have you restate that answer, if you don't mind. Uh, my name is Bill Tretbar, and um, what I said was that it provides for different levels of participation in a hearing to determine whether the alleged sexual harassment actually occurred, depending on who the claim is asserted by, who's, who it's asserted against. There's no question there's things we don't know about how the people that dictated that these regu that these policies be adopted are going to work in, in cases, and uh, there is food for thought. But the reason we now have a sexual harassment policy that reads very specifically when we already had two good ones is because federal law says we have to have this policy to comply with uh, Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972. And as Tom says, you know, it's nice to think there's a new administration, so in the first week in office they'll undo um, some of the reg regulatory um, work of the prior administration. It never completely works that way. It didn't when the last president took office. I don't know if this is answering your question at all. It does, I guess I would say, flying over at high altitude, there's more uh, procedure. I don't want to call it more bureaucracy. There's more people involved in investigating it. There's more formality required if, the, if either side wants it. There is protection for the victims of sexual harassment. At least they pay lip service to those uh, concerns in making supportive measures available to the complaining parties. I guess that's about how I would describe the change. Stan Reeser, District 4. William, uh, Dan, or, or Tom, it, do you feel like it's fair that if any of these regulations get changed or overturned, um, we would probably have to come back and remove this policy at that time, um, or would we leave it? Uh, I anticipate that these regulations will change, and when they do, uh, Mr. Lawrence will bring back the policy to uh, make sure you're in compliance with the new regulations. Thank you. Any other questions for our, uh, our trio? Thank you. Again, this is uh, first reading, and we will proceed uh, uh, to a second reading on this uh, uh, new policy uh, at a future board meeting. Dr. Mike, next item, please. Under Operations, Wichita High School North mascot. The Doc purpose of oh, this sorry. item is to discuss the Wichita High School North mascot name. Many organizations and teams, from professional teams to college teams to high school teams, have started evaluating the impact of culturally insensitive mascots. The board received many letters requesting that they look at the Wichita High School North mascot to examine the social impact and ramifications on our students and our district. BOE policy 1216, school themes, is provided in Appendix 16 for reference purposes. This item is for the board's discussion and or appropriate action. Dr. Thompson, I'll let you introduce, your, uh, introduce this topic and uh, who you want to per, uh, proceed to uh, address the board on this item. Thank you, President Reeser. Um, thank you for allowing us again the opportunity to come and visit with you about um, North High, um, Wichita North High. 
Um, I am going to kind of give a background of kind of, um, and I guess Terrell is going to, Mr. Davis is going to do that, but uh, you gave us a charge a while ago to put together a committee of folks to be able to begin conversations as we begin to hear concerns from our community about um, the Redskins um, that is related to North High School. Um, once that you gave me that charge, we worked within our team and we um, have Mr. Terrell Davis who uh, took upon this project to work with our community leaders. Um, he has a group of folks, I'll let him introduce all of those folks, um, but I will um, let you know that this has been an, a pretty lengthy period of time um, since we've had this opportunity and we've been meeting on a regular basis with folks to be able to um, come to some conclusions and some offerings for you this evening. So without further ado, Mr. Terrell Davis can take it from here. Thank you. Good evening, President Reeser, Vice President Blakely, and Superintendent Thompson and BOE members. I would like to start out by acknowledging all of the letters that we have received regarding the topic of the Wichita North High School and its mascot, the Redskins. We'd like to thank all of you who have took time out of your busy schedule to write, call, or email, or even visit in person, both for keeping the mascot and for those who would like to see a change. We appreciate your input and want you to know that we read each and every communication. This is a very sensitive topic, and as such, we would like to warn you and the virtual audience that we will be discussing a potentially emotional and racially charged subject. The subject is, matter is graphic at times, and we will do our best to present it in a historical context. Our committee set out to explore this subject and had guiding principles. One of them was that we were not historical revisionists. We would research and state facts as printed and discovered Secondly, we would respect our differences and our unique perspectives, and we vow to learn together in this process. With that being said, I will present the findings of the Wichita North High School Mascot Committee. So what brought us here today? And uh, Dr. Thompson did a great job of giving us the lead in. Uh, July 30th, 2020, uh, we were directed, the superintendent was directed to assemble a group of stakeholders to review the mascot, and the charge was given to create a committee that would develop a timeline, create potential questions for discussion, and bring back the committee uh, back work to the board. Uh, Superintendent, Superintendent Thompson agreed to proceed with this charge. Members of the committee, uh, Terrell Davis as the chair. Uh, we had the administration from North High, both Principal uh, Stephanie Wasco and Assistant Principal David Self. Uh, from the Native American Department, uh, Dow. From the Native American Spiritual Leader, uh, Mr. Mark Brown. Uh, the North High AD, uh, Anthony Douglas. Uh, faculty member and parent, uh, J.J. Lowry. Uh, student Rep, uh, Browen Rudis. Rudis. Uh, alumni representative, Mr. Jeff Watkins, and then uh, education volunteer coordinator from the Mid-American All Indian Museum, Michelle Conan. And I did not pronounce uh, Dow's last name because I did not want to mess it up. <laughs> so out of respect for him, I did not go there. Uh, a couple of the members of the committee are here today and I would like for them to stand up if they would, and then we can acknowledge them. Can we give them a hand? <laughs> Thank you. So with our team, we develop processes and norms. And what we decided is that we would meet monthly. We'd have a two hour meeting. There would be an hour for a presentation and then we would have question and answer period of time and then we'd have time to reflect. And so we selected different topics to flow through this process. We chose uh, October to do the history of North High School, uh, November to look at the history of the red skin mascot in December, we looked at uh, why the name Redskin might be offensive, and we put might in there because we wanted to learn uh, what the insight of the word was. Uh, in January, we looked at positive Native American representation in mascots, and then in February, we looked at perception and financial costs of changing or if it was just a situation of rebranding. We had some debate, discussion, and decision-making, and then our next steps. North has a rich history uh, it was established in 1929, 
And in fact, it was one of the first million dollar building projects in the state of Kansas. One of the first things that we learned is that not only does uh, North High School have the mascot, the Redskins, but there's also the Butch the Buffalo. And one of the uh, founding principals uh, did a, a uh, naming uh, exercise with the student body to name this uh, buffalo head that they had on loan. And so through the students, they came up with the name Butch the Buffalo. One of the things that is amazing is this quote that we found in one of the yearbooks. Um, and this is from uh, Bernadine Jensen, class of 1930. It was chosen with pride, talking about the name Redskins, because we were the only school which could carry the name, the emblem, and the symbol of the Native Americans. We admired the Indians and with pride could carry their banner of distinction. We wanted to share that with you because we wanted to share that there was no malice in the selection of the Redskin by the leadership. Since 2016, the school has adopted this emblem of the shield, drum, and feather. And when you look around North High and different representations of North High, you see this uh, symbol around there more than any other symbol. North High has a rich, rich history. And you see uh, pep assemblies uh, where student and the student pride that they have here on this campus as well as, and I always tell people this, the uh, TP exercise that the seniors do every year. Uh, I'm from Oklahoma, we've never done that, and so that's a learning experience for me. Uh, no one from North has been able to fully explain that to me, but they take great pride in TPing uh, the campus every year. Uh, and of course you have uh, the carry out right across the street. Again, we are tradition here at Wichita North. So as we look at this and we look at the word, According to the Smithsonian historian Ivis Goddard, early historical records indicate that redskin was used originally as a self-identifier by Native Americans to differentiate between the two races. The first recorded of use of the word redskin in print was in 1815 by Chief Black Thunder in an interpretation of what he said to the governor of the Missouri Territory, William Clark, as tensions begin to rise due to the U.S. attempts to overtake Indian lands through the Treaty of 1804. Author L. Frank Baum, best known for his, his historic Wizard of Oz, celebrated the death of Sitting Bull and the massacre at Wounded Knee with a pair of editorials calling for the extermination of all remaining Native Americans. In December 1890, Baum wrote, with his fall of nobility of the red skin is distinguished, and what few are left are a pack of whining curs who lick the hand that smites them. In 1915, poet Earl Emmons book, Redskin Rhymes, was characteristic of the usage of the word redskin in the early 1800s and 1900s as the word went from being an identifying term to a derogatory slur. We have this cartoon here of, you know, someone's explaining, but I'm honoring you, dude. As we look at the term redskin, let's look at meaning. From the American Her Heritage College Dictionary, the word is used as a despairing term for Native American, offensive and used as an insulting and contemptuous term for an American Indian. In fact, a redskin does in fact mean the scalped head of a Native American sold like a pelt for cash. In our research in the Daily Republican newspaper and from Minnesota, September 24th, 1863 reads, the state reward for dead Indians has been increased to 200 for every red skin sent to purgatory. This sum is more than the dead bodies of all the Indians east of the Red River are worth. Red skin equals scalp. As we look at the Native American mascots, 
It's important to understand that not all Native Americans are from the same tribe. In fact, there are over 570 Native American tribes, bands, and nations in this country. A word can be offensive simply because of its history, according to Jeffrey Nunberg. You can't pluck the term out of his history and say, because my intentions are honorable, it's okay. Our committee looked at different mascots throughout 259, and this is probably one of the most powerful meetings we had when we put this, screen, this um, slide up for our committee to look at. One of the questions we asked ourselves is which stands out? As we look at all the animals, the occupations, and others, we see only one has race or culture, and that's North Redskins. In 2005, the NCAA started the process of restricting the use of Native American nicknames. There are some exceptions. These schools have explicit agreements with tribes to use their names as mascots. As we look at the Seminole brand, Florida State, remember earlier we pointed out that there are over 570 different tribes, and here's an example of the diversity within the culture. Florida State has an agreement with the Florida Seminole Tribe. The Florida Seminole Tribe purchased the Hard Rock, Hard Rock Cafe for $965 million in cash in 2006. Each of the approximate 2,000 tribal members receives a monthly benefit from those benefits equaling $128,000 per year for every man, woman, and child. But there's also the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma with its 17,000 members living outside of Florida. The Seminole Nation condemns the use of all American sports team mascots in public schools, by colleges or universities, and by professional teams. And in contrast to the 128,000 per man, woman, and child for the Florida Seminole Tribe, the Seminole Nation only averages 25,000 per family in terms of income. One of the questions we asked ourselves and I asked our committee, well, is there a positive Native American name that can be considered? The question comes to mind, are all Native American symbols offensive? One of the things that our committee was able to come to the conclusion is that there is not one symbol can it, that can encapsulate the rich history and tradition of the Native American people. With over 570 different tribes and bands, we feel that we could never pick one mascot or one emblem that could encompass them all. In fact, in the state of Kansas, there are four tribes which have reservations that are federally recognized. The Kickapoo tribe, the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, the Prairie Band tribe of Potawatomi Nation, the Sac and Fox Nation. If we were to pick, which one do we select out of the four that are federally recognized for the state of Kansas? As we look at some of the places where you see the Redskin name in athletic facilities, you see it on flagpoles, scoreboards, pool banners, athletic gyms, entrances, athletic chairs, sc uh, scoreboard panels, gym floor, even GWAL banners throughout the city. It's on athletic uniforms, 19 different sports for boys and girls, home and away, and practice gear and team bags, dance and cheer uniform. It's on wrestling match mats, volleyball pads, floors, chairs, and signage at North and in GWAL gyms. At this time, we have a short video we would like to share with you.
proud, forgotten, Indian, Navajo, Blackfoot, Inuit, and Sioux, survivor, spiritualist, patriot, Sitting Bull, Hiawatha, and Jim Thorpe. Mother, father, son, daughter, chief. Apache, Pueblo, Choctaw, Chippewa, and Crow. Underserved, struggling, resilient. Squanto, Red Cloud, Tecumseh, and Crazy Horse. Rancher, teacher, doctor, soldier. Seminole, Seneca, Mohawk, and Creek. Mills, Will Rogers, Geronimo. Unyielding, strong, indomitable. Native Americans call themselves many things. The one thing they don't What a powerful video. We go back to our committee members, and this was an awesome, awesome um, opportunity, and I want to thank Dr. Thompson for allowing me to participate. Uh, this was an awesome group of people to work with. Uh, we all came in, again, with our own unique perspectives and experiences, and with our vowing and commitment to each other to learn together, we went on a journey together, and we were able to challenge each other. We were able to expand our own knowledge of different subjects, but we were also able to learn a lot and to really have some moments where we had to look inside ourselves and to figure out where our own biases were and what we could do to do things different and how we could view things from the perspective of other people. And so I really commend this group and just applaud this group again. Uh, we ranged in age from 18 to almost 80 and just the, the different perspectives that everyone brought to the group. Uh, several of us are from Oklahoma and you can't study Oklahoma history without studying Native, Native American history. We were also in communication with uh, Union High School who was going through this process and they were actually finishing up as we were starting and Shawnee Mission High School or Shawnee Mission School District as they were going through theirs. And so we were able to learn from different groups and get feedback from different groups and uh, it was just a, a great experience. From this group, we have four recommendations for the board tonight. The first recommendation is that we would discontinue the use of the Redskin mascot and nickname. The term is offensive to Native Americans and the Native American culture, and the term is racially and culturally insensitive. With this recommendation, we would also not recommend or not direct North to select a new mascot. As we looked at the rich history of Wichita North, the pride is just that. It's in being a part of the Wichita North family. And so we want to be able to embrace that pride. Uh, we also, again, don't believe that there is a mascot that could totally encapsulate the rich tradition and history of the Native American people. And so instead of leaving out a section of the group that the school and its forefathers wanted to honor, we feel that we would focus on the great pride of Wichita North. Second, uh, recommendation is that we would adhere to the BOE policy 1216 on school themes. The school principal is responsible for the development of school themes, songs, flags, mascots, and so forth. The principal is particularly responsible for determining what these themes are not offensive to minority ethnic groups within the school. 
This is a school board policy that's already on the books. And our recommendation from our committee is that this board would adhere to its policy 1216. Third recommendation, that this process would be a two-year phase-in plan starting in 2022, 21-22, excuse me, school year, and commencing in 22-23 school year to remove red skin from athletic, fine arts uniforms, jerseys, and facilities, school-related activities, and school apparel. The exceptions, all trophy cases and statues will remain as they are currently. This is not about rewriting history or erasing the great pride and accomplishments of the Wichita North High School community and alumni. Again, we're not setting out to be historic, history revisionists. The reality is, is that the, the forefathers and the, the uh, people who've come before have all had pride in their school. And we want to re keep that intact. And so we would not, we recommend not touching the trophy cases and the statues that are on campus. And then our fourth recommendation is a development of a ninth grade curriculum to be implemented in advocacy class that highlights the great history of Wichita North High School and its Native American influence. The, the curriculum would be developed in conjunction with the Native American programs in our district and include hands-on experience with Native American artifacts. It would highlight the history of the location of the school, why the location was selected, the history of the building, its construction and unique historical architecture. As you see the shield and the drum and the feather. In closing, during this presentation, you have read or heard the name Redskin 45 times. Our committee debated if we should use the word in our presentation tonight, but the decision was to allow you to feel the uneasiness of hearing and seeing the word over and over again, as this is what our Native American students and other students who find it offensive experience every day at school. Student leader and committee member Brian Reedus put it best. Historically, the students at North High have seen nothing wrong with the Redskin name because it's been a center of pride for so many years. It is hard to think that this symbol we love so much is wrong and insensitive. As a school, we pride ourselves on acceptance and support of cultures that are represented at North. But that doesn't change the fact that the name Redskin goes against everything we stand for. As time change, we need to realize this and be ready to change with it. We're not trying to erase history, but instead grow from where we were to where we need to go. I now stand for questions. Thank you, Terrell. Ron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Davis, for that. Um, a lot of information there, appreciate it. Uh, as a North High graduate, I just wanna say thank you for um, putting that piece in there about educating our students. Um, there's a couple of names uh, I think was, uh, may have been left off the presentation, but um, Jesse Chisholm was another famous Native American, and so was uh, Charles Curtis, who uh, were, I taught at Curtis Middle School. He was the vice president, unfortunately, for President Hoover. But <laughs> either way, uh, he was uh, vice president of the United States. And again, just thank you for doing that, because I know when I taught, I did teach some uh, Native American history, and the resources are a little slim. So I really applaud that you guys are doing that for the students here at North. And uh, again, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, sir. Cheryl. Thank you very much. That was a very powerful presentation. And I think you have fulfilled what we wanted you to do, is you spent time to look at what this problem was and came back with some recommendations that we can look at. You, you dealt into the policy and and as a board, that's exactly what you wanted, we wanted you to do. I also very much believe I have heard from both sides on this issue. 
Uh, originally, back in July, we didn't ever think that it would be this long without having people back at the podium. But we can't wait any longer. If we're going to really move on this issue and remove that term from the building, we've got to start now. And I have had, and so have the other board members, literally hundreds, if not thousands, of emails. We had 126 just tonight. And they are on both sides. We're hearing people that believe in the traditions and want to keep it, and we're hearing from people that believe it is time to change. I happen to side on the side if it's time to sh change. So I would like to make a motion, and then we can have further discussion. But I would move that we adhere to our own policy, which is policy 1216, and we accept this committee's four recommendations which include the use of the name Redskins as the North Heights mascot slash nickname. Robert Thomas, District 6, I second. Moving in a second. I just wanted to clarify that motion. Cheryl, Cheryl did you mean include dropping the name? Uh, dropping the, dropping yeah. the use of the name. Okay. Did I leave that word out? That's an important word. Thank you. <laughs> dropping just, the use of the name. That's correct. I just correct. wanted to clarify that. Yes, thank you. Ernestine? Well, uh, we do have a motion uh, moved by Cheryl and uh, seconded by Ron, but we will have discussion. I just want to thank so much for that presentation. It was very powerful. The other thing is, is that I do think that that kind of education is not only needed for North High, but I would like to see us put it throughout our district, finding a way in which we can have that kind of education. The fact that our city is on that land that was once held by Native Americans should make it required that we learn who was here that got pushed off, quite honestly. So I really am excited about the idea of adding the education to North High, but I would like to suggest, not putting it in the motion here, but suggest that we find a way that the education is spread throughout the district and at Wichita that is named after a tribe become a center in which we are, we put our money where our mouth is, we put our education where our hearts are, and we really teach our students. And it's another part of being able to be very ethnically inclusive and rejoicing. Thank you, Thank you Ernestine. Ben? Yes, Ben Blank, the District One. Um, so, I, when I started service on this board um, and we started meetings up here at, at North High, um, it, the, the mascot kind of really struck me really deeply. Um, and it was not a word that I was ever comfortable using. Um, I'm from South Dakota um, and the high school I went to is about 30% indigenous people. Um, and so I had a lot of uh, Lakota Sioux classmates, um, and that wasn't a word that you would ever think about using uh, in front of your own classmates. Um, so I have tried to avoid using it for, what, the past four years now, um, and so I think this is a positive, uh, positive development, and if we can do one kind thing in this heck of a year, uh, let's do this. Thank you, Ben. Julie? I also want to, Terrell, thank you for this great presentation, especially that video that we saw at the end. It's a very moving presentation. You've done great work on your committee. Um, I, um, I just want to make a comment about the, all of the emails that are included in tonight's agenda that'll be added to the minutes that Dr. Mike worked uh, so tirelessly putting together for us that yes, there were comments on both sides of this issue about um, the, the mascot. I, I won't repeat the, na the word, but about the mascot. Um, but the, there were two things that I saw as consistent in all of the emails. I read every one of them. Consistently, I think every single one was positive about North High, the education that they had here, the amount of pride that they had in 
being educated at North High and coming from North High, I, that just was throughout all, whether they fell on one or one side or the other of the issue of the mascot, they were all proud of North High. And the other thing that was consistent, um, and of course it wasn't mentioned in all of the emails, but whenever it was mentioned, there was, net, there was always positive comments, and I say this as a, an architect by profession, <laughs> there was always positive comments about the architecture of this building, the pride in um, the artist uh, work, uh, Bruce Moore, um, and how significant this um, architecture and this structure is in the city of Wichita. So that, that again, it wasn't mentioned in all of them, but if, if it was mentioned, it was mentioned um, that we love the architecture, we don't want the building to be changed, we don't, you included the statutes not to be changed, uh, but everyone um, applauded uh, the architecture and the, and the great artistry in this facility. So uh, I just wanted to make those two comments about the, about the feedback from, um, from folks. Thank you, Julie. Um, Terrell, my question is, when was this policy established about uh, school themes? Or I can ask Dr. Thompson. Someone well. knows. 1971. 1971. Okay. Yep. So 1971. And the, the policy came to uh, the board's attention uh, fairly early in this process. And so we've been asking feedback about this policy because tonight, the way I see this question is not so much the question of we're going to remove uh, a, a mascot. It's really a question of whether or not we're going to follow our own policy about school themes and if they fall into the area of culturally insensitive or derogatory. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And then what is the experience of, you mentioned uh, Union High in Tulsa. Um, what was their mascot's name and what, what type of experience did they go through? So the Union High mascot was actually the Redskins as well. And I grew up playing against Union in, in Oklahoma. And so although they had the name, the Redskins, they did not necessarily have any necessarily a Native American attachment to it. They just had the name. And Union always went as the U, University of Miami, so they always just had the green and red U that was kind of their focal point and not necessarily the Redskins. It was just their, their mascot. But they really didn't have any representation, if you would, of that. And so this year they made a decision in the fall to uh, discontinue the use of that mascot as well. And I think that leads to my last question. Uh, I think it's clear that this board does not want to do anything to diminish the legacy and the proud tradition that this school, Wichita North High, has had in our community. And when does the, did the committee, when they looked through the, the shield, drum, and feather, did they feel that connected the, if we so choose to remove the offensive language but still keep this uh, emblem, did it fit that goal? Yes, sir, it did. And we did have a conversation around that topic alone. And again, the school has been using uh, the emblem or logo since 2016. Well, if anything, uh, and speaking to my fellow board members, if anything, 2020 has been an extraordinary year. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we cannot speak for previous boards on why this is now coming up at this particular moment, but I do think we spoke a lot about history tonight. We have an outs a wonderful opportunity to correct a past wrong, and we can move forward while respecting the legacy and the tradition of this high school. And I think this is a, uh, a, a move that will heal some wounds, will start the process of healing some wounds. It will not correct everything that has ever been done. Um, that probably will take another century to do. But it's clear that this term 
uh, while uh, well-meaning people uh, truly wanted to honor uh, the ancestors of this land back uh, when they chose this name and started using this name, it's clear that this term has clearly become a slang term to mean ra with racial overtones and derogatory meaning. So uh, I appreciate the work of this committee. I appreciate the open-mindedness that everyone in this community has had about uh, the patience they've shown us on this issue. And I agree with Cheryl that it is time and we have a nice plan to phase this in. We will, your legacy of what you consider yourself in previous class is graduating, that will not fail. That will always be with you. That will always be with us. And so um, I will be voting for this motion. Any other discussions? Ernestine. Well, I just wanted to say that I think that we are at the fullness of time in this nation. I Not agree. just here at Wichita, but in the nation. We are all of us becoming more sensitive to other people and how they feel about words. Um, words hurt. And I really think that if we were not to move forward, that we would miss a time in which it is a great time to educate our children, but a great time to educate the city of Wichita. And who knows how far our influence can spread. But I think that it is, for whatever reason, it is a time in which all different groups are beginning to be we would hope be honored and not disparaged. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can be a leader in that, that we can be a leader in our community that not only are we not gonna disparage Native Americans, but we are not gonna disparage any ethnic group. We are not gonna disparage any group. We welcome them all. I think that this is a, a wave that we must move forward with. I I agree, I think we've always figured that this school district's diversity is our greatest strength, and we cannot be divisive while claiming we want this great big house of diversity. So, uh, any other comments? With that uh, concluded, uh, we have a motion on the floor by Cheryl, seconded by Ernestine, I believe, yes. Oh, Ron, I'm sorry, Ron. Ron. Thank you, Ron. Um, and we will now vote. Motion passes six to zero. Thank you for your time and effort on this trail, and thank you, Dr. Thompson, for your uh, help in this item and uh, thank you for the Board of Education and for of keeping an open mind on this issue. Thank Dr. Mike, next item. Members. Second review, 2021-22 district calendar. The board had its first review of the proposed 2021-22 district calendar on January 11, 2021. It Do is recommended that the board adopt the proposed district calendar with August 12th, 2021 as the first day of school and May 25th, 2022 as the last day of school. Dr. Thompson, do you have uh, anything you wanna add to, uh, to this item? Uh, I'd just like to thank our committee, um, the calendar committee for all their hard work. It takes a, a lot to pull this together. So thank you to the committee uh, led by our human resources division uh, we appreciate it. Cheryl? I just have one question, Dr. Thompson. Um, the spring break, because we've had a problem in the past of ma not matching to our colleges, does this match to the colleges in our surrounding areas? Yes. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Ben? Um, yes, uh, Dr. Thompson. Um, I did get a couple uh, messages about um, fall break not being a full week and was it winter break not being a full week is that is that true um if you look at what is your fall break uh november 
Um, yes, it is not a full week. Uh, the, the week, I mean, the uh, fall break starts on the 24th, the 25th, and the 26th. You ask me about Christmas, and if you look down in December, it looks as if you will start your time on the 17th student recess begins, and then it we will not return back until January the 4th, so it's more than a week. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also, uh, I know at the beginning of, of this school year, it's unique for many reasons, um, but we had to shift the calendar. We started later, and then we compressed everything, and then uh, rather than a traditional like snow day, we would have remote learning days for the rest of this year. Um, are we anticipating anything like that for the fall? Are we planning for anything like that? And are you talking for the 21-22 calendar? Yes. Yes, there is, uh, as we call them, so lovingly call them snow days. They are embedded uh, in this particular calendar. So we will resume snow days for 21-22 calendar year. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. And I, I do want to clarify that that uh, fall break that's traditionally around Thanksgiving, we will be rever- reverting back to the previous year where the day before Thanksgiving starts that fall break. Any other discussion or I would entertain a motion? Ben Blankley, District 1, I move we accept the proposed calendar for 21-22 school year. Is there a second? Ron Rosales, District 6, I second. Thank you, Ron. We have a motion by Ben, seconded by Ron, to approve the 21-22 school calendar. And you may vote. Motion carries 6-0. Dr. Mike, next item. Finance Resolution 2021-01, Energy Service Contract, ESCO. On February 24, 2020, the board approved an agreement with Navitas to provide ESCO services beginning with an investment grade audit. Tonight's presentation will provide an update on the process, outline next steps, and propose the first phase of scope and pricing for approval. Thank you. I again will ask talk, Dr. Thompson to introduce this, and we might start off by uh, just in, uh, saying what ESCO stands for. I'm going to, I know that's in their presentation that I've reviewed, so I'm going to let them have at it. However, what I am going to do is just to say that this is a, um, we've, we've talked about this several different times throughout the last, um, oh boy, year or so, (laughs) and we've come back here several different times, and we are now ready to go. Uh, And so I have my colleagues here, um, Mr. Luke Newman, um, who uh, runs all of our facilities, does a magnificent job, and we're so blessed to have him as part of our WPS family. And then I am (laughs) going to also turn it over to my colleague, uh, the incomparable Susan Willis, our financial, our chief financial officer. All right, thank you. Well, good evening, Dr. Thompson, President Reeser, and Vice President Blankley, and fellow board members. Uh, As Dr. Thompson said, my name is Luke Newman. I'm the Director of Facilities. And uh, my colleague Susan and I are here tonight to um, review the status of the energy service contract agreement uh, that the board approved about a year ago now, and to uh, provide some recommendations for next steps moving forward. So as you as you will recall, at the board meeting held on February 24th of last year, we we reviewed. It does feel like a long time ago. <laughs> um, oh, I remember. Feels that. longer than a year ago. <laughs> um, we reviewed the energy service contracting framework and received the board's approval to authorize Navitas to proceed with an investment grade audit of 26 of our buildings. The investment grade audit took a deep dive into our building operations and utility bills to determine potential energy conservation measures for the program, and those are called ECMs. We did experience some delays due to COVID, as did everything else, 
uh, which led us to splitting up the first phase into two phases in, or, in order to move forward with some of the less design intensive work uh, quicker in order to start capturing those energy savings. So the presentation tonight will cover the combined conceptual scope and budget. I just realized I'm still on my first slide. Um, it will cover the combined scope and budget for both phases one and two, but we will only be asking for your, your <coughs> approval to proceed with phase one at this time. Phase two is currently in develop, <coughs> development and will be brought back to the board for approval, uh, review and approval later this spring. Okay, we've got this slide here uh, that you may or may not be able to see because it's kind of small, the uh, graphic there is a list of the 26 sites and the proposed scope included in phases one and two. The X's, if you can see them, I'll go, don't worry if you can't because I'll go over it in just a sec, indicate scope that will be included in phase one and the O's indicate scope that could potentially be included in phase two. And I say could because the amount of scope we are able to include will depend on the, how the final pricing comes in and, uh, and how that all fits in the final pricing model and, and how everything pays back. Um, we're prioritizing the items that pay back the best first uh, while also using this opportunity to replace some critical HVAC components that really, really need to be replaced, uh, but the payback on them may not be as great as some of the ones that we've placed as higher priorities to start. So a review of the scope for phases one and two. Phase one will include LED lighting upgrades, uh, tightening up some building weatherization, which is basically just sealing up cracks in our buildings that aren't insulated well. That's called weatherization. Uh, a few water efficiency upgrades, installing some low flow uh, water fixtures, and converting to a pool chlorine generation system at one of our sites. Phase two will include the more design intensive HVAC items, which are temperature controls replacements uh, and, and adjustments, boiler replacements, and possibly some chiller replacements, depending on how all of our pricing shakes out. I have a, uh, a snapshot of our schedule that you're now seeing in this slide. Uh, phase one, as you can see, is, uh, is ready for award and implementation, which will be followed by a savings and verification period to confirm our projected energy savings are being met. Uh, that will be followed uh, by Navitas going through a measurement and verification process. Uh, Navitas is guaranteeing the energy savings criteri criteria will be met, and as such, they'll be monitoring the utility bills and usage closely to confirm uh, everything is aligning. And I'll review some examples of what that looks like on the next slide. So the next step, in addition to approving the phase one scope, is to move into the development stage of phase two, which will require the board's authorization to enter into an agreement with a mechanical engineering firm. That firm will work closely with Navitas to define the scope and proposed ECMs in phase two. They'll produce design documents for bidding, and provide quality, quality assurance and commissioning services uh, during construction. This will be the second recommendation we make to the board for approval tonight. So here are some examples of the savings and ver verification process and some of the software that is used. Uh, the graphic on the left represents the ongoing uh, data trending, monitoring, and adjustments that will occur in our HVAC controls to ensure our systems are performing at an optimal level, and that'll be an ongoing process. And the graphic on the right is an example of an energy report that provides a summary of building utility usage and trends and, and how we're spending. And these are just a couple of examples of, uh, of what we'll be looking at. There's all kinds of data we dive into, and uh, it's uh, pretty interesting and complex, and uh, but it, uh, ultimately, it's, it's all to document that we are accomplishing those savings that we have committed to. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Ms. Susan Willis. Uh, good evening, President Reeser, Vice President Blankley, Superintendent Thompson, members of the board. Um, so Luke and his team have done a, uh, the heavy lifting with Navitas to get ready for the scopes of phase one and phase two. And then uh, I've kind of come in at the last minute to kind of arrange the, how are we gonna pay for it? So 
Um, we have had a lot of conversations related to project costs, um, and I think it's important for the board to um, rec uh, remember some of the conversations we had from last year, even though a lot has transpired in that year. But a lot of this work, in fact, the majority of this work was work that was on the deferred maintenance list or a replacement list that we had not been able to get um, to get enough financing around to get the work done. Remember, we're coming out of years and years of, of pushing other expend, expenditures into capital outlay during budget cut times. So the list of projects that we needed to work on has grown and grown and grown, and we have been exploring options to find ways to attack that, that hole. And this, this energy savings contract model was one of the solutions we brought to you this is how um, there, we have one way of getting a lot of this work that needs to be done, desperately needs to be done, and we have a way to pay for anything we have to finance through the energy savings contract model. So that, that's just important to remember as we go through this, that this work would have needed to be done at some point anyway, and this model gets us there faster. So as we look at the project cost estimates, phase one work is estimated to be about $3.7 million. Phase two will be just shy of $12 million. And the engineering um, design cost firm that we, we are looking at for um, phase two work will be about 672,000 just shy. So the total estimated project costs at this point are $16,355,000. Next slide, Luke. So as part of this energy savings contract model, we are looking at a lease purchase financing um, opportunity. Again, in February of last year, the board approved up to $30 million of possible lease purchase agreements. Um, and essentially what a lease purchase is, is it operates similar to a loan. So if you need a car, you don't have to save the money uh, to buy a brand new car, you finance that car. That's essentially what we're going to do with a lot of this, um, a lot of this maintenance replacement work is we're going to finance and pay for it over time, but we're gonna get those improvements in our buildings within the next year or so, hopefully about a year or two. Um, approximately $11 million of the $30 million of, of lease purchase authority was used to purchase technology. So we have about $19 million left under that um, particular board authority item um, for discussion tonight. Next slide, Luke. So we had some options as we started to look, look at least our lease purchase plan. The first option would have been to take both phase one and phase two out to the market right now and get um, basically get a loan and start making payments but we're not ready for phase two. So that didn't make a whole lot of sense to pay interest on a loan for a big piece of the project that won't happen for several months. Um, we talked about taking phase one out for bid, getting a, a, a lease purchase arrangement in place for th that work, and then going back out to market for phase two when we were ready. But again, we believe that, that packaging up all of that, it will get us the best loan rate if we need it. And that way, there's, it, it's lower loan costs because we're only going out one time. So what we're going to recommend to the board tonight is that we actually go ahead and plan on paying for phase one in cash that we have in capital now. And then when we go out for phase two, and we, as Luke said, we're going to come back to you for that authority. To, to, when we're ready for that work, we're going to bring that back that we're going to sign tonight an option that the board can exercise to go back and include phase one costs in a phase two lease purchase agreement, if we want to. But the board does not have to do that. We will look at our cash flow at that time and we will bring that recommendation to you. But this, this option package gives you some flexibility. And if we've learned nothing during COVID, it's we need, uh, the ultimate flexibility to maneuver funds where we need to put them. So a lot can happen as we've seen in a couple months. We don't wanna necessarily commit to a course of action tonight until we know what, that we're, what, what we're gonna to bring to you for phase two. So we're just basically going to have you sign a, we might wanna do this, so we're gonna give ourselves the option to do this. Next slide, Luke. 
So our proposed financing plan for this energy, serve, uh, energy savings contract model is the board will approve phase one, if the board approves phase one, the board will approve use of capital outlay um, to fund phase one and design costs, and then the board will approve a resolution to allow the board the option to roll those phase one costs into a phase two lease later this year and repay capital if it so chooses at that time. So th this is the kind of the financial analysis for a possible financed phase two to show you how that energy savings model actually works. So as we shared, the phase two costs under the lease purchase agreement would be just shy of the $12 million, kind of what we anticipate to be the worst case scenario deal because interest rates are, are low would be a 15-year, 2% loan um, structure. So our finance costs would be about $13 million eight, and our projected utility savings over that time would be 13, almost $14 million. So the project cash flows without us having to put a dime of capital into it with the savings, if we so choose to go that way. So, we will not have to go into capital outlay, which leaves capital outlay for other projects. So that's the advantage of this program is it pays for itself over time and you get the work done now. So we, again, three formal recommendations tonight. It is recommended that the board enter into an agreement with Navitas and proceed with the proposed phase one scope at a cost of $3,732,263. This would be funded out of capital outlay. Recommendation two, it is recommended that the board enter into an agreement with PEC engineering firm for an amount not to exceed 671,600 to act as lead designer and commissioning agent for the phase two scope to be funded out of capital dollars. And phase three, it is recommend, or recommendation three, not phase three yet. Recommendation three, it is recommended that the board adopt resolution 2021-1, declaring the intent to authorize the reimbursement of expenditures related to the acquisition of energy conservation improvements for the district. Just the intent, not the actual um, adoption. Adopt the resolution, not the plan. So this gives us flexibility. Any questions for Luke or myself? Er, <clears throat> excuse me, Ernestine. Well, right now we're at historic lows on interest. Wouldn't it be a better idea to have our capital money that we have now used for phase two and borrow money right now while it's at such extreme historic lows for the phase one? So we consulted both with the placement agent we're working with and um, Gilmore Bell uh, on this matter. Um, and they both recommended that the, the, we wait because they don't see that the, those interest rates are going to change dramatically okay. in the few months that we'll, it will take to bring back a phase two option. Okay. Um, the second matter is I don't have that much cash to pay for phase two. Phase one, we had a plan to pay for part of that already, so I don't have to provide a whole lot more additional capital spending authority, but $12 million of additional capital spending authority we don't have. Okay. Julie? It's nice to be back to normal business, isn't it? <laughs> yes. yes, it is. Just to make sure I understand these figures, um, and I'm going to use very rough figures, like millions of dollars rough. Um, you've got the detail in your sheets here. But it looks like the total project is around $16 million. Um, of that total $16 million, about $3.5 million will come from capital outlay. The rest will, in essence, it'll initially be borrowed on this lease agreement, but then you'll have savings of utilities from the projects that'll, that'll basically pay that back. So of the total 16 million, about three and a half million is coming from capital outlay. 
The rest of it is coming from savings. We're gonna get all these improvements and all these energy saving measures done that then are gonna continue to save us money in the future. Julie, that, that number is closer to $4.2 million because it's 3.7 of phase one and the $671,000 design costs. Okay, so about 4.2, 4. 4. but otherwise my summary yes. is yes, correct. not understanding 4, it Yeah, 4.3, 4.2, 4.3. So this just kind of, I mean, we're spending 4.2 uh, capital money, but we're getting a lot more dollars of that in improvements, and a number of those improvements are gonna continue to save us money for years to come. Correct, and, and as Susan said earlier, I think the thing to remember is this is all stuff we would have had to do regardless, so it would have come out of capital eventually anyway. Um, we're just taking a chunk out now. Yeah, seems, seems like a win-win to me. <laughs> so um, I, um, I'm in support of this, and um, do, we, do we have a motion on the floor yet? Okay, I um, I uh, would like to make a motion. Um, we can continue discussion if other people want to say things, but I would like to make a motion to move forward with recommendation one, two, and three as presented uh, tonight by um, Luke and Susan. If Second. I can say it in that way, since it's all written down here. <laughs> I believe we can do that, Julie. Is there a second? I second the motion. We'll continue discussion, but there is a motion on the floor. Ben? Um, yes. Uh, hi, Luke. It's good to see you again. Hi. Thank you. Um, so uh, f if I remember correctly from um, last summer, before we started the school year, we had to change because of the pandemic. Sorry, Julie, to bring the pandemic back, but <laughs> we, it's still happening. Um, we had to change some things about our air handlers in regards to that, which were projected to have an increase in utility costs. Um, as, as the investment grade audit was going on, were those modifications taken into account in our projected savings? That's a really good question. Um, the, the, it's the pandemic, it threw the whole thing off, to be totally honest with you, as far as the baseline uh, energy. Uh, all the energy bills that they used to establish that baseline were from previous years. And that's the discussion we had numerous times about how do we make sure, um, you know, that it's an apples to apples comparison uh, when we do go through the measurement and verification process on the back end of this contract. Um, and that's going to be part of the ongoing discussions and how we define those measurement and verification criteria. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can do it and how you can measure it. Um, I'm not going to get into it too deep, but you can, you, there's energy models that you basically compare against old, old building usage to new. We're probably not, that's probably kind of out the window at this point just because of how different things are and how different we operate our systems. What I can tell you, and uh, some of those, some of those uh, things we don't, some of those questions we don't have answers to quite yet, but what I can tell you is uh, for phase one, these are all fixed cost items that we're talking about. So. It's hard data that we know exactly, basically, once you install it, you measure before and after, and, and you can, the scientific data behind it will tell you that your energy savings are gonna be X dollars. And they've done uh, back, backward engineering. How do you say it, Randy? The reverse, ut re reverse, re reverse utility, utility <laughs> engineering, thank you. <laughs> and I do wanna give a quick shout out to my colleague, Mr. Randy Scott, who's here tonight. You've all heard his name and the amazing work he's done on the pandemic HVAC operations, but mm -hmm. he's been critical in this as well. So appreciate him being here tonight. Um, but yeah, so, so phase one, phase two, we'll develop that and we'll figure out what that criteria needs to look like. But for phase one, it's all pretty much hard data and uh, a lot easier to, to define, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does, thank okay. you. I'm just gonna try to, uh, simplify this for the public. Um, Dr. Thompson, is it fair to say that what we fell behind on maintenance uh, for our heating and air conditioning during after the Great Recession of 08 in the Brownback years, in order to catch up on maintenance, we're going to take the advantage of a low interest rates, the savings we get from these projects, and then we also have the option with phase two that if our savings are even better 
we could also free up some money to perhaps catch up on some other uh, capital improvement projects in the future, depending how we want to either use the loan or actually pay in cash. Most of that is correct. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that's I think that's it, a pretty. It is correct. Yeah. It is correct. Uh, it is correct. It, it it was it's a simplified version of what's correct though. That is correct. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I kind of see my job. <laughs> and I, I agree with Julie. This is a this is a win-win situation. Any other discussions or questions? We have a motion on the floor by Julie, seconded by Cheryl. Cheryl, thank you. Uh, to take the three recommended actions and uh, start getting these projects done and start saving us some energy. Motion carries 6-0. Dr. Mike, next item. Under miscellaneous. Thank you, Luke. Thank you. Under miscellaneous superintendent's report. Dr. Thompson. I have nothing, thank you. Dr. Mike. Board of Education report requests. We'll start with Ron. Uh, yeah, Ron Rosales, District 6. I just want to recognize uh, Dr. Evans and uh, Stephanie and Melissa for their work on uh, Safe Streets. Um, and representing uh, 259 in this uh, uh, community organization. So really appreciate it and some great things being done there. And to all the uh, uh, award people getting awards, you know, I've been seeing some things. And uh, thank you, Dr. Thompson, for keeping the recognition going while we're in this, and not only for the teachers, but the, but the students as well. We appreciate it. And Ron, we thank you for your ongoing communications with the North High community about the issue that we discussed tonight. Thank oh, you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. Ernestine? Well, I got to attend by uh, remote the team, Cedric County Team Justice Community Summit that was about juvenile justice and ways of changing and making it so that we have a better and more equitable kinds of treatment of young people. And I was just real impressed with the speakers and the presentation and the information. And we had people from our district that were uh, on the presentation too. But there's some exciting things. And I've talked to you before about what the uh, North, I mean, West High had been doing with, with, and this team justice thing was looking about how to carry that into not just in the schools, but carry it into life, into the way that the uh, law enforcement treat juveniles and ways that juvenile issues are handled in a way that makes it so they don't, it doesn't end up a school to prison pipeline or a childhood to prison pipeline. And Ernestine, we appreciate your work on this topic. And I think as, you see, as you'll see when we as we continue to refocus on what our strategic plan, you're going to see re, uh, restorative practices uh, topic come up before this board in the near future. So Good. thank you. Ben? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to give a shout out to the, uh, the athletic directors at our high schools and, um, and, the, and their staff um, for really doing a, an awesome job at live streaming uh, events across our district. It's really kind of, it, I mean, if, if you can look at one positive thing to come out of all of this, it's that we've been able to allow many more family members that don't even live anywhere near to be able to see um, their, 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 their child's uh, performances and, and athletic abilities across the district. And as, you know, at district leaders, we can just hop between various games on any particular night, something that would have normally required driving across town multiple times. Um, so it's, it's really uh, kind of an awesome, and, and it's neat to see the progression um, from when they started live streaming to what it is today. And there's still improvements that are, that are happening every week. It's just awesome to see. Thank you, Ben. Julie? 
Um, yeah, um, we said earlier tonight that one of the awesome um, hallmarks of Wichita Public Schools is our diversity. Another one of the awesome hallmarks of Wichita Public Schools is our excellent magnet programs and magnet options. So I just want to remind the community that if you are interested in enrolling in one of our magnet schools, great options out there. Um, if you're interested in, enro in enrolling, the deadline is coming up February 19th. Thank you, Julie. And I think uh, the school choice issue, uh, we're com we are committed to that, and we will continue to try to speak to our uh, friends in Topeka that school choice is already available, and we are committed to that 100%. Thanks for bringing that up. Cheryl? Yes. Um, I just am very pleased that I feel like tonight we've kind of taken a giant step out of COVID back into the real world. And, and by passing the anti-discrimination policy tonight, which has been ongoing for quite a while, and the North High issue with their mascot, and resuming the reports on the strategic plan, and we're, we're always continuing to monitor COVID, but we're not letting COVID be the 100% of what we're dealing with, and that's a breath of fresh air. So thank you to you, Alicia, and to your team, and to all the hard work of the board members as we get to move back to a tiny step back into normal. Thank you, Cheryl. And I'll just dovetail on that. I was gonna ask Dr. Thompson if tonight, after tonight, based off the Sedgwick County uh, Commissioner's decision on increasing um, mass gatherings, and uh, so forth, if you would be willing to bring back to the board at a uh, future time um, the possibility of bringing public speaking back to our board. Uh, and I recognize there's gonna be many aspects to this plan uh, be necessary to ensure that, that it's done in the most safest uh, environment. But with the board's permission, I would like to ask that the uh, superintendent and our leadership team develop a plan so that we can move forward to restore some level of pu public access to our meetings. And I don't think we're gonna need a motion on that as long as, uh, unless somebody wants to uh, uh, disagree with that statement and then we could take a motion. We'll but just if, let, her, let the team bring back a proposal and we'll look at it then. That was my thinking, Ernestine and uh, Dr. Thompson. Is that possible? And what do you think? We will have a plan ready. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. We always uh, appreciate your cooperation uh, and your willingness to listen to the board. We thank you for that. Um, Stan, could I? Uh, yes, uh, Julie. Yeah. Um, when when you're. Um, when you're looking at um, the plan for the future, I'm just wondering if as we go into the far future, <laughs> you know, like out from here on out, um, if um, one of the things we can have learned from the pandemic is, is that all sources of communication are positive. And so maybe as we allow uh, folks to come back and speak to us in person, uh, if we could also continue this process that we have started of, uh, of allowing communication in email. Um, you know, one of the things I noticed from our emails that we received tonight is a number of them were from out of state. And um, I don't know how many issues that we would have that that, um, that out-of-state folks would be interested in speaking to, but we do sometimes have, uh, have parents that are working second shift that can't attend our meetings at the time frame. Um, you know, folks can have mobility challenges, you know, and other reasons why they couldn't get here. So um, if when they're looking at our proposal, if they could also look at a future plan of in including not only face-to-face -face conversation from the public, but also then continuing email conversation from the public. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. I, More work for Dr. Byers. I, 
Thank you, Julie. But I think we did, we've now learned that there's many ways to communicate now, and public speaking is, is one of them, but there may be other ways as well. If you'll indulge me one more thing, um, Dr. Mike has asked me, and I, I agree that we should quickly go over um, when we have that March 3rd interview for the applicants, and I think it'd be nice to let them know even ahead of time, the topics we have used in the past for the uh, interview process has been the broad categories of budget, mission statement, board relations, diversity, student relation, uh, excuse me, superintendent relations, and uh, the last topic of community relations. Uh, Dr. Mike, did you want a, um, an assignment for each of these categories tonight, or did you just want the uh, topics announced? Uh, our past practice has been to, to do this at the board table, and that way the board members can prepare questions. Sounds good. And do a round robin for each applicant. I, I think, th I thought that's what you meant, but uh, I wanted to make sure. Uh, Cheryl, of those top, of those, um, six topics do you have one particular one that you would like and i can um, reread those if you'd like uh, i think i have them thank you um, i i would like to have the mission statement but i would like permission from the board to expand that to include the mission statement and the strategic plan excellent the last time we did an interview to replace someone we didn't have a strategic plan we do now so i would i would love to have that as a uh, be able to write a question for that. Do you want one question or two? Uh, right, unless somebody says they don't want any, uh, we'll... No, I mean for each oh. one, do you want one question or two questions? Just one or, and then a follow-up. Okay. Ben, do you have a topic you would like to prefer to have? Um, I could do diversity. <laughs> Julie, that leaves you with uh, budget, board relations, or community relations? Uh, I'll take board relations. Ron, uh, that leaves you with um, budget, superintendent relations, or community relations? Community relations. So we have Ron for a question on community relations. And Ernest, you didn't. You didn't include uh, superintendent relations in my list. Whenever I, I got to pick, I didn't that want one. you to have. I didn't want you to have that one. <laughs> Okay, great, because that's the one I was going to pick, and then you didn't read it in the list. So I'll take superintendent, and she'll take uh, board. Did you catch that, Dr. Mike? <laughs> I, Look at his... I, I need to hear that again, please. Um, Julie is going to have the question on superintendent relations. Okay. Uh, so, Ernestine, that leaves you, and I will take the last one. I'll, let, I'll take the one that you don't pick. I'll take uh, the board relations. Okay. And that will leave Stan Reese. Uh, Ernestine's going to ask a question about board relations. And then um, myself, uh, Stan Reese, I'm going to ask a question on the budget. Isn't that nice that we left that for you? Thank you. <laughs> I think it, I think it worked out well. Picked anyway, right, Stan? Dr. Thompson or Dr. Mike, do you need any other clarification on that area? That works. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Um, Dr. Mike, next item. New business. We did new business, but um, I think it's in the rules if anyone has any other new business. See no business, no new business. Uh, Dr. Mike? Executive session. Ben? I move the board recess into an executive session for purposes of consulting with the board's attorney on a matter involving pending litigation which is deemed privileged in the attorney-client relationship pursuant to KSA 75-4319B2, and the board will return from executive session to this room at 9.15. Is there a second? I second. Moved by Ben, seconded by Cheryl, to move into executive session on a current uh, attorney-client uh, matter. And you can vote. Motion carries 6-0. We will return at 9-15.
Education is resuming uh, their regular meeting. Dr. Mike? Executive session number two, personnel matters. Ben? I move the board recess to an executive session for purposes of discussing a matter involving a district level administrator under the non-elected personnel exception to the Kansas Open Meetings Act, KSA 75-4319B1, and the open meeting will resume at 9.30. Second. Moved by Ben, seconded by Cheryl. Raise your hand if you're in favor. Motion carries 4-0, Logan, Reeser, Blankley, and Rosales. We are now in executive session. Wichita Board of Education uh, meeting is uh, re-adjourned. Yeah. Um, no uh, actions necessary from the executive session. Uh, Dr. Mike, next item. Move to adjourn. Do I have a motion? Ben Blankley, District 1, I move to adjourn. Cheryl Logan, I second. Moved by Ben, seconded by Cheryl to adjourn. All those in favor, raise your hand. Motion carries 5-0 with Hedrick, Cheryl Logan, Stan Reeser, Ben Blankley, and Ron Rosales. Thank you for your time. Thank you.